As I, was, as I was traveling, I had, a, I had a couple moments. I remember I had a time on Friday where I, um, I was trying to figure out how to deal with this time difference, right? I, was, I called Hannah at some point on, on Friday after I'd gone through my entire day's work, and, and we were done a bit early, but I, I called Hannah on, on, on FaceTime, and, and she answers a video call, right? She answers, and there's Hannah, like, in bed, right? <laughs> um, just waking up, and we were just trying to, she's, she's like, and we were having this conversation, and she's like, I think it's time to wake up Junia. I'm not really sure what's going on. I'm like, she's like, when are you going to get going with what you're doing? I'm like, my day's over, actually. Um, it can be disorienting. Um, the, the whole time, still dealing with the jet lag, it can be disorienting when you don't know what time it is. And I think this is essentially at the heart of what I think we're going to find in these three chapters of 1 Corinthians we're looking at today, right? You, if you don't know what time it is, if you don't know kind of where you are in the day, or in this case, where you are in the unfolding of God's plans, you're going to end up kind of getting disoriented, getting things wrong, acting in a way that is inappropriate for the time that it is. You know, one of my um, favorite scholars of Paul says, reading Paul is often like overhearing one side of an argument. And as we've been going through 1 Corinthians, looking at what it is to be church and reading this letter, I think there are occasionally times, and I think this is one of them, when we're especially aware that we are listening, listening in on just one side of a conversation, like hearing one side of a telephone call. You can you can figure out a bit of what's going on, but you, boy, you wish you had the other side, right? And I think actually um, in these three chapters, we need to know what's going on on the other side, and we actually get quite a few hints. So we're actually going to do a little bit of detective work as we're thinking about what time it is. Um, a little bit of detective work as well to think about what's the other side of this conversation? What is Paul responding to? We're covering a lot of the text um, at once today as we go from thinking about being church to specifically to talking about imagining church. We're going to be talking about three different chapters, so let me just summarize for you quickly what's going on in these, and then I'm just going to kind of drop in um, at places that I think are particularly relevant for the thing that God would have us chase down this afternoon. You can, by all means, please do read this later on in its entirety. I think you'll get a lot out of it, much that I will not have a chance to talk about. But here's basically the overview so that we're oriented. In chapter 5, um, which is where we're starting today, chapters 5 through 7, in chapter 5, we learn about one of the practical concerns that has come to Paul. He says, you sent, sent some people to me, and I, and I have some concerns Namely, the major concern in chapter 5 is that a man is sleeping with his stepmother. Okay? He's sleeping with his stepmom, and he thinks that's a-okay. In fact, Paul says, there are other people in the community who think that's a-okay. In fact, more than that, they're boasting about it. So this may not be something that kind of got back-channeled reported to Paul. They may actually have, like, proudly told him this. You can wonder, like, what kind of worldview, right, is, 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 is causing this. But at the moment, um, this is the problem. And in the back and forth about this, Paul actually interestingly refers to a previous letter that he's sent them. A previous letter. You said we were reading 1 Corinthians. This is the first letter to the Corinthians that we have. But we know from 1 Corinthians that it's not the first one that Paul wrote. Um, sadly, there's at least one earlier letter that, that didn't survive. Um, and, and, and Paul refers to some of the things that he told them then, among which was, like, I'm not big and nor is the Lord on sexual immorality. Um, we don't know exactly what the letter said, so I can, uh, I, can, I can summarize casually. But that's one of the topics. He says, look, this already came up. We talked about this. Okay. In chapter 6, then, the concern is, is regarding unity, which is a concern we saw right at the beginning of the letter. Paul said, look, you've got these factions. This group says this. That group says that. And in chapter 6, this gets picked up again. He says, it's gotten so bad that I hear that there are lawsuits among you. You all are suing one another. Not good. Um, you get some back and forth on this. This is especially a chapter we're not going to be able to deal with very much. I've preached about this before. I encourage you, maybe if I'm on the ball, I'll email out a link to, to a talk um, drawn from this chapter. Um, that I think, is, I think God has a lot to teach us here, actually, because Paul has this amazing solution. What, how, how can you get out of this horrible situation of having lawsuits among you? He says, here's an easy solution. Why not just be wronged? 
Why not just be defrauded? Like, just get ripped off, and then you don't have to sue anymore. Wow, that's like, right, that, that is a head-scratching kind of solution, but it's, it's, it's one of the things Paul has to say in chapter six. Like he said, read about it, check it out. Uh, I think there's a talk on the ECV Talks website that'll help you explore that a bit. In chapter seven, which is by far the longest chapter and the one that we'll probably spend the most time in, Paul starts addressing particular issue, issues that the Corinthians have actually asked for help on. Presumably, given the fact that they are kind of divided into factions and, and squabbling among one another, these are probably the, some of the issues that they disagree about. And they're looking for Paul to declare winners and losers. What, what Paul does instead is give a long series of very complicated answers that boil down to various shades of, it depends. Right? If, if you go through those, there's a lot of them, a lot of things going on, we'll talk about a few of them. A lot of them, they basically boil down to, it depends. Depends on the situation, depends on this, that, the other thing. And sometimes Paul will just say, meh, I don't know. Jesus says this, I would recommend this, meh, I don't know. Interesting. In the process of doing that, I think Paul teaches us something fundamental about what it is to discern God's will in the church. This is striking. We'll come back to this several times, but it was, it was, it was said to me by someone I was, I was having, having dinner with um, while I was traveling. He said, it's so striking that Paul here doesn't just tell them what to do. He could have. He's not afraid from telling them his opinion, but he's careful about saying that it's his opinion. And he's interested in something else. I think he's interested in telling them how to be this sort of imaginative community that's able to discern God's will. And all of that has to do with, as I teased earlier in the week via email, with this question, what time is it? And in chasing that down, my hope today is that we'll caps a glimpse of what church, what, the, what, I've, what I've said is like the town council of God, that's the Greek word ekklesia, the town council, what, what, what church is for. And the spoiler, I'll just tell you at the beginning, church is, and this is, I think, in some ways, the, the, the thesis of the entire first letter to the Corinthians. Church is a discerning community. It's a community that exists in order to discern the will of God and hold one another accountable to walk in obedience to what is discerned. All right. That's where we're headed today. Um, before we get too much further, uh, let's, let's, let's pray. Holy Spirit, we, I, just, I invite you here um, as, as, as we look in your word, as we um, kind of puzzle through what, what it means, just the, the words, trying to understand what it's all about, how it's all fitting together. But even more than that, Lord, as we're trying to understand what it means for each one of us, what, how, where, where it applies to our lives, what you would have us do with it in our lives. I just ask that you would be present here for that. The words that you've given me to, to share would, um, wouldn't just kind of glance off the surface, but they would go deep. Um, and what would go deep would be precisely the heart of what you have for us, what you would say to each one of us here this afternoon and to us as a community, as church gathered here in this place. Amen. All right, um, so we got, we got a bit of the overview of what's going on in these three chapters. I want to go back to the, to the very beginning, and we'll just kind of drop the needle here and there. I want to go back to this concern about this guy who's sleeping with his stepmother. I actually thought about titling this talk, Why Not to Sleep with Your Stepmom? <laughs> um, I thought that would be provocative. If I had come up with that, that probably would have been the subject line of the email this week. Um, because to some extent, right, I think in some, like, all three of these chapters are an extended reflection, like a long disquisition, on how this seemingly obvious decision gets made. And Paul, Paul writes, Paul begins by, by writing this. He says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. He, he can't even believe it. And of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. And you boast about it. You're bragging about it. Ought you not rather mourn? And it doesn't get better from there, what he has to say. 
This begins a tirade that, that, that carries into Paul's concern about, about lawsuits. And eventually, after talking about lawsuits for, for, for a while and talking about how, how, how his great concern that the community pursue holiness and unity, two things that if you know much about church are pretty hard to hold, it can be really hard to hold together. Everybody has a different idea of what holiness is. So it's very hard to pursue holiness and unity. Paul, Paul says, no, 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 you have to pursue both. And yet, he, then he, he comes back with a, with a simple question later in chapter, in chapter 6, after talking about losses. He says, or do you not know, this is verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And such were some of you, that is, unrighteous, unjust. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. This is serious business, Paul says. Holiness is an important concern because there's just, there are certain things that can be in your life that are just incompatible with the kingdom of God, with the good things, the big thing that God is doing in the world, the things that you can have in your life that are simply incompatible with that. And then he goes on to quote what is apparently a Corinthian slogan. This is why your editor has put it in quotes. He says, all things are lawful for me. Actually, co- quotes this a couple more times later, later in, the, in, in the letter. We'll see them in a few weeks. The slogan, all things are lawful for me. All things are permissible, we might say. All things are allowable. Anything goes. Where on earth would these folks have gotten an idea like this? Where would they have gotten such an idea that they would so boldly kind of say it to Paul, right? Paul's quoting this back to them. So they said it to Paul. All things are lawful for me. Where would they get such a crazy idea? My hunch? Paul, right? Take, for example, this this that he has to say in Galatians 5.18. He says, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You're no longer subject to the law, to religious law, to the Corinthian mind, perhaps, to moral law of any sort. Imagine that Paul has said or written something like this to the Corinthians. Maybe a line like this got dropped into the first letter, or it's central enough to his preaching in Galatians that it's hard to imagine him not ending up saying something like this during the months during which he was planting the church in Corinth. He said something like this. My hunch is he may literally have used the phrase, all things are lawful for me. It might well have been a refrain of one of his sermons. Whatever he said, it wouldn't be so hard to conclude, even from the letters, without speculating beyond just the letters of Paul that we have themselves, just looking at Galatians, it wouldn't be so hard to conclude, all things are lawful for me. Even more, Paul, in the same, in the same letter, perhaps provides, that is in Galatians, provides the specific fuel for this fire in Corinth, when he cites the baptismal formula. This is something that was said when, when folks were baptized. And we know that Paul baptized, he admitted it in chapter 1, he baptized a few people in Corinth. They will have heard this before. This is his baptismal formula that he used in his churches. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no male and female anymore. Apparently, then, according to the Corinthian mind, sex is no big deal. This is what they conclude. Conclude, all things are lawful for me, there's no longer male or female. Done. Tell you what, Paul, message received. In fact, one of our guys sleeping with his stepmom. I think that's how the logic works. Or look at it this way. One more reason to take this this slogan as Paul's. Look at it this way. If Paul weren't invested in this slogan, his response could have been much simpler. This simple response that perhaps we would expect, right? He could have gone ahead and quoted their slogan and said, you say all things are lawful for me. But tell you what, no, not all things are lawful for you. In fact, some things are not. Namely, sleeping with your stepmom, right? And I could go on. I could give you, want a whole list? I will give you a list, right? That's not the argument he makes. Now, he'll make a list. He makes makes lists for different reasons, though. But Paul against everything that we, would ex- we might expect, Paul sticks to the slogan. He repeats it back to them, doesn't disagree with it. Instead, he, he, he adds to it. He says, sure, 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 fine. All things are lawful for me, 
But not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. It's remarkable, right? How many religious leaders would make this move? How many could resist simply giving them a bunch of rules? But Paul refuses to do so, but says, look, the stakes are still high. The stakes are still, what I said to you at the beginning, it's still true. It's important. You've got to hold on to that. I'm not willing to throw that under the bus in order to solve this, this little moral problem here, this ethical problem. The stakes are still high. There's some discernment to be done. Paul refuses to just give them the answers. Why? I think it all has to do with what time it is. What do I mean by that? Well, what time, what time is it? It's something that we haven't really talked about yet in this series of talks, but it's something that we've seen already several times. We've been reading along in 1 Corinthians. We've seen it in the text already. Paul is often talking about this age or this world, distinguishing them from what is yet to come or what we already have seen him call the kingdom of God. What is now coming to be in Christ that is in the church. And so there's this age and there's the age to come. There's this world and there's the kingdom of God. It, we, I, we, can, we see it here. Just uh, Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Or, or again, later, yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age. We looked at this a couple weeks ago. We found these markers make the whole difference, right? It's not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. That's important. But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. We could multiply examples. There are at least six or seven other verses we've already seen right, that we could go ahead and add that are talking about this age, age to come, the kingdom of God. But the key, at any rate, is this. It actually comes towards, toward the end of our passage today, and we'll arrive at it again later. The form of this world is passing away. The form of this world is passing away. I think the ESV, which you have in your books, um, says the present form. There's, uh, it's, that's probably true. He's indicating which, but that, it's over translation. It's just the form of this world is passing away. This is actually what Paul's baptismal formulation or formula from Galatians is all about. All of these old status indicators, Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female, and in a patriarchal society, male and female were status indicators. They don't apply in Christ, Paul says, which is another way for Paul to say in the kingdom, because it is in Christ that the kingdom becomes present. And so all of these things that made the world what it was, these basic building blocks of the world as you understood it, they're part of what is now passing away, part of what is being transformed. These things no longer work as foundations for the world, at least they won't for long, because the form, the the very shape and structure of this world is passing away. And the Corinthians are among a group that Paul describes as those upon whom the end of the ages have come. And so they live in this paradoxical place. You've been around here, you've seen this kind of diagram before, in this overlap between this age and the kingdom of God, this age and the age to come, this world and the new world that's being created in the new creation of God. They live in this paradoxical place, sandwiched between two ages, two worlds, with two very different structures, you almost say two different physics, two different ways that things work. And this actually has everything to do with the harsh things that Paul often taught about the law. That's a confusing topic in, 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 in Paul. He seems to talk out of both sides of his mouth, but I, I, I take it they can be summed up this way. Paul would simply say, you see, in the old world, the law was good. It was. And to whatever extent that world's still around, it is. But it belongs, to, it belongs to the age that is now passing away. This is the, the Jewish law, all good moral law, actually, I think Paul would include in this category. Those that would disagree, but I, I think that's the case. 
It belong, all of this law belongs to an age that's now passing away. In its prescriptions and proscriptions, what he says to do, what it says not to do, it is, it is useless in the coming age. In the old age, it was quite useful for distinguishing between good and bad, but not in the kingdom of God, not in the age to come or the age that Paul says has now come upon us who are part of the church. In the kingdom of God, and the, and the whole point here is that in the kingdom of God, fully realize, you get this from, um, from Ezekiel, from uh, um, Isaiah, from other passages in the Hebrew scriptures, Paul says, look, in the fully realized kingdom of God, you don't need an external law. You're going to have a law written on your hearts. You're going to have a law that is, that is within you. The spirit will so fill you that you won't have to know what the rules are because your whole mind will be transformed. And so law, law is great. It was good. But it's part of the, it's part of the world that's passing away. And there's a new way of being that you better get accustomed to. What the whole judgment is about is shedding that which is attached to the old world to purify what's going on in the next. That's the way Paul talks about it. But the problem, of course, is we don't yet live in that full, fully actualized kind of kingdom world. But Paul says, for now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. And in the ancient world, mirrors were dim and they weren't we think of mirrors like, oh, it's exactly the same. No, not the image. Um, a mirror, like some really dim, dark, like misshapen thing, right? It's, just, it's kind of cloudy. You can get, we see just, just a little bit, um, a little disorder. You can see the image in the second half of the comparison. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. For now, our knowledge is incomplete, Paul says. And so our sanctification, our being made holy, is necessarily in process. We don't, I don't know about you, but this rings true for me. I don't just naturally decide to do the right thing. <laughs> it's not actually inborn in me, like, completely yet. From time to time, I have an instinct that's about the right thing to do. Not always. But what Paul's concerned about is that any law we could produce at this point would itself be rooted to this world and to this age that is coming to nothing. Because the kingdom is not about law. The kingdom is about renewed minds, renewed imaginations. Law itself is simply the wrong paradigm, Paul thinks. Worse than that, he says, obedience to the law can become an attachment to this world that is passing away. So law obedience is actually... Uh, is actually counterproductive on Paul's account. As you read in the letter to the Galatians, he, says, hey, he, is, he is hot and bothered right, about law observance. He does not want them to do this. But why? Because it atrophies precisely the moral imagination that the kingdom requires. It, it's, like, it's, like, it's like you take those muscles that you need for the kingdom of God and you just lie, let them lie fallow. Even secular people know this, I think, though they talk about it differently. Philosopher, moral philosopher Barry Schwartz, um, he, he'll complain, he says, about what he considers kind of legislative overreach and things like sent, sentencing um, requirements. He says, we're taking from judges their ability to judge, to actually give good moral, moral judgments, and actually make calls that are in the real things of life, not about systems, but about making the right call at the right time in the right place and doing what is good. He sees this as a part of a larger problem in our culture. We've made law after law after law, rule after rule after rule, the result that we no longer have to think about what is right or good, only about what is legal. In the digital realm, I take it it's even worse. This will start to sound like what Nietzsche predicted, um, believe it or not. In the digital realm, we tend to write software such that what is morally wrong or legally wrong is technically impossible, right? Sorry, uh, th that file's copy protected. Um, not, not it's illegal to copy it. I'm just actually going to make it impossible for you to copy it. You just don't have the password to do that thing. And so with, with the result, in the digital realm, we hardly think at all about what is right and wrong. We only think about what's possible. So far gone is any kind of serious reflection about what is good or noble or beautiful or right to do in the world. It's madness, but this is legalism run amok. Legalism, ironically, always has the outcome of, kind of antinomianism, right? Legalism always results in people doing whatever the heck they want, right? Because their moral, their, their ability to think about what's good and right gets so blown away, just gets so atrophied by disuse that, that at the end of the day, when we run into something we don't know 
uh, that, that isn't legally prescribed, and there will always be such things, um, we don't know what to do. And so we just end up doing what we want. Because we haven't been trained to think about what's good. We see this in religious communities all the time, especially in church, where religious laws have disastrous, can have disastrous consequences. Christian rules against divorce end up forcing women to stay in abusive marriages. No one intends the rule to work that way, but the proliferation of law does this. And I've, I've sat with abusive husbands, not in this church, but I've sat with abusive husbands who can only see their, that their wife is wrong because she wants to leave this abusive marriage. The husband expects the church to be on his side because he's following the rule by not, by not seeking divorce. He wants to stay in this relationship in which he has all the power. The rule has created an impoverished ability to reason morally, to think carefully about what marriage truly is, about what commitment in a marriage is really about. Or take the popular Christian rule about gays and lesbians in the church. Love the sinner, hate the sin. The formula itself is constructed precisely to distinguish between the person and their behavior. And yet, I have yet to meet a gay or lesbian person outside the church, and very few even within the church, who hear this slogan this way. No one intends that rule to contribute to a culture of hate that drives queer teens to commit suicide at a tragic rate, but it does. Because the rule has atrophied our ability to reason morally about sex and about difference and about holiness. It's, it's, a, it's a train wreck and no amount of work trying to retool and fix the rule is going to, to, to change the situation. I've talked before about the way, one last example, about the way that even a law that I'm a fan of, the no sex outside of marriage rule, I'm a fan of this rule, this becomes a no sex before marriage law and therefore drives young Christian people by the thousands to get married too young. One does away with sex before marriage only to end up producing an epidemic of Christian marriage before commitment and divorce before 30, as it turns out. Because a whole generation of people has been given rules about sex and marriage that have prevented them from developing a mature ability to reason about sex and marriage. Marriage becomes merely a thing that has to happen so that you can stop feeling guilty about having sex or wanting to have sex. And all of this from a good law, a rule I'm rather in favor of, so far as rules go. It all goes to prove the point. Legalism ultimately brings about the atrophy of the faculty of moral reasoning. You're not allowed to entertain, entertain making bad choices, or in the digital realm, you're not even able to make bad choices. And so eventually you lose the ability or never develop in the first case an ability to determine what is right or wrong or beautiful or good or noble in the first place. So Paul refuses legalism because he wants something more for his church. In fact, God is offering, God is calling for more from the church. The call is to be transformed communally, to have the Holy Spirit, the mind of Christ, dwell within them. And that is a communal thing. I keep pointing this out, um, but you're, it, it's, it's terrible. It's, it's hard for us who read the Bible in English to catch when, a, when you is plural and when it's not. If we had a southern translation of the Bible, it would be very helpful, actually, on this re, in this respect, right? Um, we, for example, we would see this passage, or do you not know that your body... Is, I don't know, is that you plural or singular? If we had a southern translation, we would know. Or do y'all not know that y'all's body, y'all's, y'all's plural, singular body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit within y'all, whom y'all have from God. Y'all are not your own, for y'all were brought, bought with a price. So glorify God in y'all's body. Right? We would get that if we, if we had that. Um, To live as people not of this age is something to be done communally in this communal body that, of course, Paul will talk about a lot later in the letter, but he introduces here for the first first time. Paul wants for his community to live as people not of this age, but of the age to come, not of this world, but of the kingdom of God. I mean, you could make a law against sleeping with stepmothers, You could make a law to govern the Christian life. You could make a law to govern divorce and and remarriage. But then what will you do when you have that woman in an abusive marriage come to you who wants 
Who wants to write the law and live with the consequences of its enforcement? You could make a law to define and delimit a Christian's charitable responsibilities, but then what will you do when you come across a situation where a well-intentioned person is caring for someone who cares for them, but whose needs are just too much? Who wants to take the heat for writing a policy to cover all possible situations of that type and all the possibilities that would come down that road? What Paul is so upset about is that the Corinthians seem desperate not to engage in imaginative moral reasoning. They're desperate to get a simple set of answers on what they ought to do. Like children in a fight coming to a parent, they just want to know which one of us is right and which one of us is wrong. What Paul gives them instead is a bunch of conflicting answers, <laughs> intentionally, I think. And, and, and these are drawn directly from, um, from 1 Corinthians Seven. Um, he says, for example, if you are single, you should stay single. Or if you must, you should get married. <laughs> if you're married, you should stay married. Or, you should, or get separate. He's thinking here in particular about if you're, if you're a Christian married to a non-Christian, you should stay married. Or, or, or you should get separated. Um, uh, but if you do get separated, at least don't get, uh, don't get remarried. Because he has a statement of Jesus about that. So you can like, put, a, put a stake in the ground. If you're engaged, oh boy, that's a tough one. He spends like 15, 15 verses chasing his tail on what to do if you're engaged. Even when in verse 20, it seems like we get something like a general rule. He says, each one should remain in the condition in which he or she was called. You finally just get a rule. The very next verse goes on to give this example. Were you a slave when you were called? Then don't be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, you should probably avail yourself of that opportunity. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, you just, I, just thought, I just finally got the rule. I thought you were finally telling me what to do. The first example subverts the rule. Later, we get more. Um, in, later in the, in, the, in, the, in the letter, you get these kinds of things. If you're offered meat that has been sacrificed to idols, don't eat it. Or do. <laughs> I, I actually had, I had, it was one of the uh, pay, topics for, um, for papers in the New Testament intro when I taught, taught it last spring. I actually got some really amazing papers that people were struggling with. Like, how do I make sense of this at all? Um, we actually had a couple of good ones written by folks in, in this church, actually. Um, it's really, really hard to figure out. One could be forgiven when getting, if when getting to the end of chapter 7, you simply scratch your head and ask, wait, Paul, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and I think that's the point. Paul is intentionally frustrating any attempt to simply get a new set of rules. A new set of rules that, I mean, it's not like Corinthians are going like, to live under some set of rules. Um, they may want to reject them, debate them, or, or follow them, but Paul's just not going to give them any of those opportunities. No matter what, that sort of set of rules will just become a law, like the Jewish law or a secular law or, or whatever kind of law. It'll become a law that will attach them to this age and prevent them from developing the discernment muscles that they'll need in the kingdom of God. What Paul does instead is invite them into an imaginative practice. He gives them a training regimen for building their muscles of moral discernment. He says as much at the end of chapter 7, and hopefully this finally brings everything together. He says, this is what I mean, brothers and sisters. Um, it's not often that verses begin this way. This is what I mean. We should, we should sit up and take, and, and, and take notice. This is what I mean. The appointed time has grown very short. That gap between, well, the ages are overlapping. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And, and those who mourn, it's like, Paul, you, you know you're just opening up like a whole new possible set of problems here. Anyway, um, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the form of this world is passing away. It's all about what time it is. The form of this world is passing away. The very divisions upon which the former world was built, Jew, Greek, slave, free, even male and female, these divisions are passing away along with the world to which they belonged. But it's not like we're fully in the kingdom either. 
And this may have been the confusion of some of those in the Corinthian community. They may have believed, hey, we have arrived. No more male and female. Free love. No more slave and free. Well, then, like, get whatever you can in your financial dealings. They imagined themselves all ready to know in full. Remember Paul complained last week in chapter 4, apart from us you have become rich. We are fools for Christ, but you are wise. We are weak, but you are strong. And some in Corinth thought that they were smart enough, educated enough, philosophical enough, that they had it all figured out, were already living in the kingdom fully realized, and so believed that they already had the mind of Christ in full. They thought they were above criticism and beyond needing help in discerning God's will. And Paul said in chapters 1 and 2, you have it wrong. God's wisdom is about the cross, and it can only be discerned in community. This week, he adds, and for what it's worth, you've got the time wrong as well. Check your watch. The kingdom has come. It's been inaugurated, but it's not yet fulfilled. You're just all confused about what time it is. On the one hand, you justify your living as if the kingdom were now and you knew and you already are reliable indicators of what God's will is. On the other hand, that very arrogance shows that you're actually still completely attached, completely entangled in this world that is passing away. We ought not live in this world. Its days are numbered. But the fact is we don't have full access to the kingdom in its fullness. Rather, we live in this odd in-between state. The only way for us to live rightly, to live like people who know what time it really is, is to live with this imaginative posture toward a future that is beckoning us forward. What do I mean by imaginative? I mean precisely the sort of as-though posture that Paul invites us to inhabit. It's this as-if sort of relationship to the world because it lives in the paradoxical tension between the kingdom being both now and not yet. Because each of these as-those, each of these as-ifs connects a pair of opposites. Those who mourn as if they weren't mourning, those who rejoice as if they weren't rejoicing, those who buy as if they had no commercial goods, those who deal with the world as if they didn't, and of course my favorite head scratcher, it's the first in the list, those who have wives as though they had none. What on earth could that mean? Actually, I, we get a hint later, I think, when Paul talks about the way that a married person naturally imagines themselves less free to obey Jesus because they have to attend to their spouse. Um, Paul seems to be suggesting here that there's a way to live in free obedience while still making good on one's marital commitments. Paul's no fan of, of, of divorce. This is not what he's talking about. Um, but he thinks somehow, and this, is the, this captures a picture of what this as-though kind of posture looks like. It's this paradox. You're married, living as though not. Hmm, what does that mean? In every pair, this as-though posture invites us to orient ourselves to the things of the kingdom while still dealing with the world as it actually is. To adopt the posture of the future itself in drawing the present forward. This is an imaginative posture rooted in a paradox, the very sort of thing that brings a rules-oriented thinker to its end. But at the same time, it's a far cry from anything goes. It is perhaps the most radical posture of obedience, as Paul makes clear in a verse that must have driven his fellow Pharisees absolutely nuts. He says, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. To which the response must have been, really? There are commandments about circumcision, <laughs> Paul. What on earth do you mean? <laughs> Ah, but those aren't the sort of commandments that Paul's talking about, apparently. Paul's talking about the sorts of commandments that come through a, the practice of communal discernment, of kingdom imagination. Listen, dis discern, obey, we always say around here. This is a strong vote from Paul for obey. Living imaginatively in this paradox in the time between the times means living courageously into the future of God that is invading the present, discerning carefully what may well be permissible but not beneficial, what is legal but might end up holding you under its power. Or as Paul will add later in chapter 10, what is lawful but doesn't build up the church, doesn't build up your community. 
taking seriously the call to be holy, to be set apart by God's own action, and taking seriously the reality that this imaginative work is only possible within the church, which functions as its name, ecclesia, the town council would imply, functions as a deliberative body, as a discerning community, discerning how to live in the time between the times. This is a serious, moral way of living life. The invitation to us, then, I take it, is this. Let those with Yale degrees live as though they had none. Let those with houses live as if they don't own them privately. Let those whose race or class seem to impose serious limits on their horizons live as if they had no such limits. Let those with children live without their imaginations limited by their limited expectations of what parenthood could entail. Let those who are told that the world is their oyster live as though all they have in this world is this one small local call from God to be faithful in a very little. Live in these paradoxes of the first shall become last, and the last becoming first. Listen together, discern together. More importantly, most importantly, obey together. Be holy, be set apart as God's peculiar people. Welcome the kingdom with open arms. Look forward to the day when God's judgment will come. Yes, look forward to that. I, um, I had a, a conversation on my way back. I broke one of my cardinal rules about I, I never speak to someone I sit next to on an airplane. Um, and this was like the highest risk. I just, I've had some bad experiences. Um, I was once, I, a woman once spent an entire flight trying to reconvert me to Christianity. I was just, and I was like 12 years old. Anyway, it's a scarring experience. Um, all to say, especially on a long flight from Germany to, to, to from uh, wherever, we were, Dusseldorf to, to JFK, right? Um, not the ideal time, but I broke my rule. He started it. He asked me what I thought about the movie that I had watched. And I couldn't come up with something lame to tell him. Um, so we ended up in a conversation. Um, come to find out, this guy just started telling me his life story. He started telling me everything. Like, he had this long experience with the church, but had all these huge questions about running into legalism again and again and again. And he'd walked away from that. But he had a, he's like, man, he, he was a really great guy. Uh, he said, man, but I had an encounter with Jesus. I don't know what to do with it. He's like, if, if we weren't on an airplane, I would show you my back. <laughs> the whole thing's a tattoo I got on the day that I was baptized. I got, I got tattooed the day before I was going to be baptized. Because I, I just want to say, this is permanent. This is forever. Like, I am in. And the picture of a guy with, like, a back full tattoo of Jesus would, gives you some insight into this guy, right? Um, and he just said, I want to be about Jesus, but I don't know how... I don't know what to do with this, 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 this church. Like, what do you think, man? Like, can I drink or can't I? Like, can I smoke weed or can't I? Can I do? And I was like, I just, I just thought, I have, I, I don't have answers for you, man. I, I, I think, unfortunately, I know you've been really harmed by church, but I, I think that's what, I think that's what you need. Actually, I was like, I'm kind of writing this sermon right now, actually, is like what I've been doing before I watched that movie. Um, and, and thinking about, like, talking about how we, we just can't figure this stuff out on our own. I mean, I could give you rules for these couple things you could ask me about now, but what are you going to do when the next one comes up? You got to have a community that's going to help you grow as someone who, under, who knows God. Right? Who understands the ways of the kingdom, who's growing into that indwelling of the spirit and transformation of the mind to be able to do what Paul says in Romans 12, which is to be able to discern what is good and perfect, what is the perfect will of God. This is what you need. This is what we need. If the guy lived in Connecticut, I would say, come here, right? <laughs> anyway, I, I knew some people in the town where he does live, so I'm going to be trying to connect him there. Because I've seen, in fact, that communities can function as discerning communities. I think this community, at its best, functions as a discerning community. A community that says, look, we, we have to live imaginatively into the future that God's drawing us into. And that can be scary, because it means we live without some of the rules that have made um, life easier. Rules do make life easier. Uh, but the, 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 the ceiling on what's possible much higher. 
much higher when we live into what God has for us in its fullness. All right, two questions for reflection today. First, um, what in your life requires imaginative moral reflection? Right? Um, who, and who can you invite to help you do this? Maybe it's a big life decision. A lot of the things that Paul talks about in chapter 7 are big life decisions. Get married. Don't. Um, uh, you know, seriously change your economic and social status, right, in the case of the, of the servants. Is it a big life decision? Or maybe it's a whole area of life when you, where you realize you haven't built the right muscles to tackle it in a godly way, and you just realize, you know what, honestly, I feel like a weakling trying to wrestle with, like, this is just above my pay grade. Like, I don't know how to make this call. I, I, I need to grow a bit, and I need some people to help me do that. Maybe you recognize that, that area because there's a big moral question that you just don't know how to answer. I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to seek, seek community, seek Jesus, holiness is the thing we have to pursue, but we have to pursue it together. Second, what in your life is lawful but not helpful? Or what is it that threatens to dominate you? These are the sorts of things that, were, that we did talk about a bit, or wanted to talk about, right? About like alcohol, weed, right? Like these sorts of things, right? I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna give you a rule but here's some things to think about, to reflect about, to reflect on before the Lord and with a community that will hold you accountable and be able to say to you, boy, that's the kind of thing that if it stays in your life, judgment at the end of the day is going to be painful when that's, like, when that's just cut out because that cannot inherit the kingdom and that's where we're headed. So that thing, you might as well get it over sooner rather than later. Cut that thing out now, right? Judgment is like surgery, right? It's scary, it's painful, but you'd rather have the cancer gone, right? <laughs> um, this is what God's judgment is like. What in your life is lawful but not helpful? These are Paul's two categories um, at this point for permissible things. The second category seems especially worth thinking about. All kinds of things in my life potentially fit in that category of things that are you not know, like immoral or like closed off to me, but they're, they have serious possibilities to dominate to take over, for me to end up serving them, career, influence, money, relationships. Perhaps you have things that fit that category as well. Things worth reflecting on before the Lord and together. I'm going to invite the, the worship team to, to come up as we respond. You know, each, each week, um, after we, we kind of, you know, we, I, 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 give this, I give this paradigm. I've been talking about it more and more these days. Listen, discern, obey. In our talks, we're hopefully listening to what God's saying and trying to discern together, leaning on someone who's tried to do some discerning for us. We're each discerning in our own hearts. Obedience is the most important step, though. And so in, in communion, that's why we always kind of um, follow up with communion, which is an opportunity for us to take a step of obedience, to answer and say, Lord, I, I think I've heard you. I'm in the process of discerning. I think there are some things I've discerned. I have a community I can lean on to help me continue to do that. But I just want to commit right now that I'm going to walk out those, the, those steps of obedience. I'm going to listen. I've discerned. I want to walk out in obedience. I want to imitate the life of Jesus the holiness that he had, the connection he had with the Father, where he, where he said it was to the, to the extent to which he could only do what he saw his heavenly Father doing. And we want that sort of obedience, Lord, that you come and form us. So I'd invite you, if, if you're a follower of Jesus or would like to become a follower of Jesus, as the worship team leads us into communion, or leads us into worship, I'd invite you to come forward and take off a piece of the bread uh, Jesus' body broken for you and, and dip it in the cup, his blood shed for you. It's a, a, a step of obedience to say, Lord, I, I'm, I'm listening, I'm discerning. I want to commit to obey. I want you to renew my mind and I want your holiness to take root in my life. So that's what we say, just come and have your way in this place. Purify us in the way that only your Holy Spirit can. And knit us together as that community, that together is the dwelling place of your Spirit. Come, Lord.